My guest today on Over a Beer is Artis Pabriks, former Latvian defense minister and center-right MEP. We talk about Trump, about Russia, about martial arts, and how Europe gets up off the floor. Artis Pabriks, welcome. The American election, it was to some a surprise, and to others they saw this coming, but what comes next? Are you comfortable with the Trump presidency? Well, I think that only few people can be com comfortable with uh, the outcome because we do not know what will happen tomorrow. And in some way, uh, once we think now about politics in the Western world at least, in my view it reminds a fashion show uh, where America is leading, and my problem is that I'm afraid that uh, fashion houses in Paris and uh, Holland and Italy might follow. You grew up uh, under Soviet occupation in, in Latvia. How did you see a transition from a, a, a government uh, governed by the Kremlin to uh, a, a democracy which became part of the European Union? Is there a sense, is there a narrative in there of hope of how you, you make change in Europe today? Well, it's a good question. Actually, there are differences. And there are things we can learn. The thing to learn is that uh, we can change institutions, but to change people's minds. Maybe Moses was right, maybe we need 40 years. People's mind doesn't change. I think in our case, we at least knew uh, where is the promised land. We knew what we want. And we knew very precisely what we do not want. We do not want oppression. We do not want Russian occupation. We want liberal democracy. We want democracy, whatever we understood with this. At this moment, people uh, who are voting uh, frequently for populist leaders and leadership, uh, they are trying to punish the past, punish the establishment, take re the revenge, uh, and they don't know where they are going. And sometimes I'm actually worried even more that they don't care where they are going and where all this leads. You were, you were defense minister in Latvia, and it must concern you greatly to see Russia positioning itself even just to test Europe, to test NATO at this point as well. You're on the front line there. Yes, and uh, we have been warning about these events uh, 10 and 15 years ago, and those days Frequently, with some of our friends in West who have been ascribing us to be a troublemakers, uh, just like now, I would say that I'm also alarmist about what is happening in the West. But look, uh, to be alarmist, it's important. Because uh, if you are not alarming about the worst possible choice, then you can end up just like people end up in Holocaust, because then it's too late to escape. Or you end up like we have been not warned in 39 and 40 when Soviets invaded. Because at that time our leadership told, look, yes, there are changes, but don't worry. Everything will be fine. And then when it went not fine, it was too wrong. And in our case, I am actually mm, amazed how shallow liberal democratic values are planted in the minds of the younger generation and also a middle generation of Western world. And this is really amazing. And, and Putin, uh, an authoritarian regime, sees this. And they have now a new means, new technologies, how to challenge this. And people are losing their compass, also their moral compass. We must understand that we need a leadership in Europe. We don't have really people at this moment who are willing to take the challenge who are willing to tell the truth and lead against the rising populist wave. They need to risk everything. They need to they risk need... not being re-elected. Yes, but if you don't risk, if you don't risk your life, then you cannot defend your country. If you don't risk your values, you cannot defend these values. They will be lost. And the uh, other side, like authoritarian regimes, like in Russia, they know this. And they see that Western world are becoming soft, they are not ready to defend. Just like Islamists are claiming the same. Do you think Putin wants to destroy the European Union? Um, Putin wants to return the greatness to his country. And I have no whatsoever complaints about that because everybody wants <laughs> greatness again. Uh, but the means are on behalf of others. I don't want again to pay this bill. And I think Putin understands that um, the limits of his country are quite strict. 
his GDP cannot grow, his economy cannot grow, so his choice is to weaken the other one. So, like we have a joke in Latvia, you know, if neighbor has uh, two cows and you have one, then you are extremely happy if neighbor's cow is dying, because then you feel better. So in this case, uh, Russia is playing a game to weaken the West. And it is a very successful game, because with every step weakening the West, Russia is becoming stronger. And at this moment, no matter what we think about American sovereign choice of American people, the clear outcome is that at the shortest period of time, transatlantic tie is weakened and European populist movements are getting strength because of the example of the bigger brother. You recently published a book about Syria as well. How do you see the situation in Syria with the input of Russia and the United States? How is that going to impact on Europe in terms of the political narrative? Well, first of all, I think we made a tremendous mistake in Syria already three, four years ago because our leadership in Europe were not ready to engage and Obama also was not ready, ready to engage. And um, world politics hate empty space. So it was taken by Russians and they have been the smart people. They acted smart. So in that sense, I have to agree with Trump. Putin did a great job by humiliating us. At this moment, um, uh, I'm afraid that uh, one of the possibilities would be that the new American leadership might simply give up Syria uh, to Assad and Russians. And Crimea? I think with Crimea it will be more difficult. Uh, but if it happens, uh, then uh, there is no value anymore for Western alliances, whatever these alliances are. So I would like to believe now really in checks and balances of United States in Congress and Senate. And I believe that it's time for Americans to prove that no matter what is a choice, the values of liberal, free, democratic world are preserved. I really would hope that Churchill would be alive now. You play chess. What's the next move for Europe? How do you get off playing defense all the time and start taking pieces from the other guy to win? Well, um, what I was learning from chess, uh, one of our favorite chess players, uh, Mikhail Tal, uh, actually is a world champion who won also Spassky in the 50s, um, he amazed the Soviet world because he came to Moscow and he did not play according to the rules which were set there. And if you, your opponent is playing against the rules of the game, the only way is that with every move you have to keep a stress on an opponent. At this moment it was not done from our side. How do we do it? How do you put that stress back uh, on Putin? Well. Uh, we need um, pieces with what to play, which means capabilities. And we need, which is even more difficult to regain, because money is still plenty in European Union and the Western world, the rich world. But we need will, a political will. And uh, from that perspective, I would suggest that um, European Union or uh, NATO members of uh, European continent should really gather and immediately actually follow the advice of Trump, you know, and rise their defense budget. They know what cap capabilities are needed, so they would have pieces with what to play. And secondly, uh, they must also understand that they cannot leave any action of an opponent without a response. And by telling this, I really would like to say that the West should be ready to extend hand to Russian leadership and Russia as a country but not on the expense of our national and security interests. At this moment, we were simply giving up piece by piece, just like Chamberlain some time ago, by not having anything in return. Where does Europe have influence today? Uh, you know, we, we, we embarrass ourselves with CETA, right. and uh, there was perhaps some would say too much consultation involved there and too much democracy applied. And, and uh, then we have the, the, the influence waning in, in Turkey. Uh, we have winning influence along the eastern borders as well as Putin pushes forward. America uh, today, the new presidency, thinks Europe's a joke. Where is Europe going to advance itself? Um, we still have a chance. We still have a chance. You're right, we lost a number of uh, fights. Uh, but for instance, at this moment, if you're looking to trade, uh, the world is watching Washington, the world is watching Europe. Washington is telling, we don't like EPP, trade deal across Pacific. TTIP, 
we still wait for the ball, which is on American side. I think Europeans could use this chance. We have to conclude a trade deal as soon as possible with Japan. We have to move forward with Singapore and with Vietnam. We have to move into Southeast Asia. This is the way how we actually can re-establish a little bit of our leverage. Federica Mogherini talks about Europe becoming a, a new superpower in the absence of America wishing to pursue greater influence across the world. Do you think that's realistic? Well, one of my uh, academic advisors, which is hanging on my wall in office, Nicola Machiavelli, told that the biggest mistake of politicians is to live in illusion. Wishful thinking. That is the biggest problem. European Union is still very far to be buried. We are strong yet and we can gather our strengths, but we should not uh, speak about uh, projections and plans which we cannot implement immediately. Don't need, we don't need a great uh, visions and agendas. We need one page and seven points on this page which we can complete in the nearest 12 months. And we can do this. You still do martial arts? Oh yes. Which one? Well, Okinawian. How does that differ from other martial arts? What's special about it? Well, because it's not meant for competition. It's meant for real life. Okay, and how do you interpret the rules of this martial art within European politics? How would you simplify it? Martial arts actually is uh, meant for weak and small, also like my country, and my teacher is frequently telling, look, it's not a question to win. It's a question to stay alive and survive. So if we will be motivated by this, we will not lose. The question is not to lose. You served in the military as a compulsory element for two years, is that right? Well, that was a nice time in Soviet military. <laughs> what did you learn about the Soviets and military life at that time that is useful today? I am just like many of Baltic people who in my age have been serving in Soviet military. And that would mean uh, if you want to make a deal with Russians, or with Putin, uh, and I'm not bragging here, ask us for advice. Let me give you the choice of five questions out of this ten. Can I have a first you sip can of have, beer? You can sip beer while I organize this, and then I'll ask you the questions as you please. All right, more. All right, there we go. Okay, first question, which book is currently on your bedside table? Um, you know, I like uh, all these spy novels <laughs> and <kidding>. crimis <laughs> because it makes me to relax, also thrillers. Mm. So it's um, Orphan X. What's that about? Well, um, uh, actually I would say it's about some kind of justice. <laughs> <laughs> it's fiction then. Okay. Fiction, yes, yeah, fiction. <laughs> what song best represents who you are? Well, it depends on the mood. Okay. Um, once I speak with students, I usually mention Simon and Garfunkel. Okay. I rather to be a hammer than a nail. Okay. What did you teach? I am not teaching at this moment, but usually I was teaching um, introduction into political theory or nationalism or something about comparative politics. You, you may not want to answer this. What kind of student were you? Teacher's pet or troublemaker? Um, you know, when I was studying in Faculty of History in Riga, capital of Latvia, uh, I was the one who also organized Popular Front in 89. I was uh, in the second ever demonstration of Soviet Union, so I would rather call a troublemaker. In your personal relationships, what virtue is most important to you? Trust. What does trust mean? Trust means uh, that um, you really do not doubt people who are uh, behind your back. Okay. Do you have a motto you try to live by or a saying, a proverb that you really like? No, no, I don't think, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I like a number of mottos and uh, I think they are also just like good books changing, just like our identities. But one thing what is relevant for politicians or for business leaders and others, I actually read in magazine, I think it was Time, in fact, about Muhammad Ali. And um, they were telling that once this famous person told, never look down to people who are looking up to you. And I think this is a very, very important message to many people in the world. 
Final question. If you were to have a beer with anybody across history, living or dead, who would it be? Oh, uh, I would like to have a smart and beautiful person. <laughs> Thank you for that. Artist Fabrics, cheers. cheers.